In this exercise, um, you are asked to work out essential features of the graphene band structure. Um, the problem is split into four um, parts and we will start working on the first question where you are asked to determine the basis vectors of the reciprocal lattice and construct the first Brion zone um, of graphene. So you are given the um, basis vectors of the lattice in real space A1 and A2. We see that these vectors are two-dimensional because graphene is a two-dimensional lattice. So also the reciprocal lattice will be a two-dimensional lattice spanned by two basis vectors which have two components. As a consequence we have four unknown components of two reciprocal lattice vectors, so we need to find four equations that the reciprocal lattice vectors need to fulfill. Now these four equations are readily written down. Um, we have to take scalar products of real space lattice vectors, for example A1, with reciprocal lattice vector, for example B1, and this product um, should be equal to 2 pi. Um, the next equation, second equation, would be A2. The other real space vector multiplied with the same reciprocal lattice vector B1 should give 0, so the two need to be orthogonal. Then the third equation um, is A1 vector A1 times the second reciprocal lattice vector B2 should give 0 and last we have the equation A2 times B2 is equal to 2 pi. You see we have four equations for the four unknown components of B1 and B2 and uh, we will not go through the details of the calculation but you will be able to work out the result for the reciprocal lattice vectors B1 which will then be given by 2 pi divided by square root of 3 times the interatom distance A0 times the vector 1 1 over square root of 3 and vector b2 given by 2 pi over square root of 3 a0 the same prefactor times minus 1 1 over square root of 3 so you see that the y component of the two vectors is the same while the x component is different by the sign. Now given these two vectors, the reciprocal uh, lattice is obtained by forming linear combinations of these two vectors. And I have prepared a little sketch where you see um, these two vectors, b1 and b2, uh, we have at the center the um, so-called gamma point or the zero of k space and starting from this point I have drawn b1 reciprocal lattice vector b1 given here and reciprocal lattice vector b2 given there. Now other um, points of the reciprocal lattice that are not just given by these two primitive vectors um, have to be found by linear combinations. For example, if we take the sum of B1 and B2, this would bring us to this reciprocal lattice point. If we take minus B1, minus B2, that would bring us to this reciprocal lattice point. Now, this point, for example, could be obtained by taking B1 minus B2 and this one would be minus B1 plus B2. So in this way you can form all kinds of linear combinations 
and get a two-dimensional uh, reciprocal uh, lattice representation. Now, how do we find the first Brion zone from uh, such a sketch? We start from the gamma point, which is the center of the first Brion zone by definition, and we halve the distances to the nearest reciprocal lattice points, all these distances, by vertical lines obtaining this line, for example, obtaining this line, and so on. And this volume that is then enclosed, or in, in this two-dimensional case, this area that is enclosed by these lines, this forms the first Brion zone. And we know that all um, the properties of the band structure can be obtained uh, using k vectors within this first Brion zone, because the dispersion relation is periodic in, um, in these plaquettes, essentially. So putting this same plaquette onto this lattice point would give the same energy dispersion relation um, as here around gamma. Now we can proceed um, to the second question. Uh, in the second question, we are asked to use the model of free electrons with the dispersion uh, at the reciprocal lattice position K, given by, um, let's write this down, En of K is h bar squared over 2m, where m is the free electron mass, um, times this lattice vector k, wave vector k, minus a reciprocal lattice vector g squared. Now you see, this is the dispersion of a free electron, which is displaced in k-space by a reciprocal lattice vector um, g. So we can imagine in this plane of the reciprocal lattice, to have in each point corresponding to a particular g, meaning each of these black points, to have a parabolic dispersion erected vertically, um, which would indicate the energy uh, axis. In order to visualize this a little bit, I have uh, made a sketch that you will see here. So I've now uh, kind of tilted the reciprocal lattice plane. This is my x, y, k, x, k, y plane. And the same points that you see here are now indicated by these uh, little spheres in the plane. And the gamma point, as usual, is in the center. And you also see the outline of the first Brion zone. Um, and I have now, according to what I said before, used the vertical direction in space to represent the energy axis. Now, following the prescription of this dispersion relation, we erect on each reciprocal lattice point a parabolic dispersion. That would be, for example, this one, right? It's a, it's a, uh, a rotationally symmetric dispersion. And also we can erect one above this point. Now you see that this dispersion of the um, um, parabola centered at gamma um, will only partially lie within the first Brion zone. So when we go, for example, in this uh, cut of the dispersion that I've drawn here, I've cut it open, I've essentially cut it open, open in half, if we follow this cut to the edge of the Brion zone, within the plane indicated here, uh, which is essentially given by the energy axis and the direction from gamma to m, following the dispersion in this plane gives this parabolic shape as expected, but then the dispersion is leaving the first Brion zone and according 
to our description, k um, needs to be inside. So um, this dispersion out here is no longer um, necessary to, to describe the system. Instead, we see that the other dispersion that we put up above this reciprocal lattice point, cut open as well, will along this line between gamma and m enter the first prion zone and give rise to this branch of the dispersion relation. So the thick black line that you can see here constitutes the free electron energy dispersion relation for this graphene lattice on the line connecting gamma and m. And these, this free electron dispersion will already be very close to the real dispersion of graphene if we take all the lattice periodic potential into account. So here you've seen how uh, the dispersion within the first prion zone in the free electron case is constructed along the line gamma m. Let's briefly think about what is different um, if we consider the k point. The k point would sit in this corner here, as you can see it here. And now looking at this um, top view again, you see that at the k point we will have dispersion relations from three reciprocal lattice points, from this one, from this one, and from this one, to be degenerate because they have the same distance from the k point. Okay? So there will be a dispersion that is parabolic starting at gamma going up in energy until the k point is reached, but at this point then the dispersion will be degenerate with these other two dispersions coming from the other two lattice points. That would be harder to represent in such a 3D uh, picture. But then up to higher energies we would have the two branches coming from these two uh, reciprocal lattice points which are then degenerate and go back to gamma. If you um, draw such a dispersion then you get a picture like this. So here you see um, a line connecting gamma and k. You see the first part of this parabolic dispersion that originates from this parabola at gamma and you see the second part of the dispersion that originates from this and this reciprocal lattice point that leads back to gamma and this is twofold degenerate. At this point all three dispersions are degenerate so we have a threefold degeneracy here at the k point. Now if we uh, also consider the stretch from gamma to m that would be the one case drawn here we see that the parabolic dispersion rises up to the m point and then this one kicks in and gives this branch corresponding to this branch. So we already have these two parts of the free electron dispersion and all we need to do now is we need to think about how are these two um, points of high symmetry connected along the line from k to m which would be the line from here to there. And of course along this line you can see that there will be a continuous um, evolution stemming from um, reciprocal um, lattice points here and here and they would give rise to a smooth connection between the two points, which is this branch of the dispersion. In a similar way, you can also ask for higher energy states and get these um, branches that we didn't discuss in detail. So this essentially um, finishes the second part of the problem and we will now um, proceed 
to uh, the third question, which um, has a clo takes a closer look at the endpoint where um, we have a degeneracy of these two dispersion relations. So there's a degeneracy of two, um, an orbital degeneracy of two at this point in the free electron model. Now the question is, of course, how does this degeneracy, um, how is this degeneracy affected by the presence of the lattice periodic potential? Now, the principle behind um, this is always the same. When you have a, a degeneracy of states and you introduce a perturbation, and in this case we treat the lattice periodic potential as a perturbation, then there are good chances that the degeneracy will be lifted. So we expect to see some splitting of the dispersion here into two um, separate branches, uh, so we expect the appearance of an energy gap at this point. Um, the splitting is governed by the so-called secular equation and we have to uh, look into either our lecture notes or uh, into uh, equation 3.7 in the semiconductor nanostructures book and we will uh, be able to work out the matrix equation for the endpoint which on the diagonal has a free electron like dispersion so we have h bar squared k squared over 2m um, and we have h bar squared k minus b1 squared over 2m these two diagonal elements correspond to the two dispersions that we have drawn here and here. And now we want to see how these two mix or couple due to the lattice periodic potential. And according to this formula, it is only the difference of lattice vectors that plays a role here. So it's the difference between gamma and this point, which is given by B1, according to our figure here, which plays a role and we will have Fourier components of the lattice periodic potential V corresponding to B1 and on the off diagonal we have V corresponding to minus B1. Of course we could write down an even bigger matrix um, resulting from the uh, equation that I mentioned but this equation is already sufficient to give in lowest order the energy splitting between these two degenerate states. So at the end we are interested in the splitting for values of k equal to b1 half and we see at b1 half this diagonal term and this diagonal term give the same value and these two numbers, which we don't know quantitatively, but these two numbers will split the energies uh, and give rise to the band gap. Now this is the Hamiltonian matrix that we want to consider and we have the corresponding coefficients of the wave function which is CK and the coefficient CK minus B1. And to complete the kind of truncated matrix Schrödinger equation, um, we have the energy on the right hand side and the same component vector CK, CK minus B1 on the right hand side. So this is the complete secular equation that we need to solve to find the energy splitting. Now since the lattice periodic potential is real valued, we have in addition the relation that Vb1 is equal to 
v of minus b1 star. So the conjugate complex of this matrix element is this matrix element. And this makes sure that we get real valued eigenvalues. Okay. Now, um, proceeding in our solution, what we have to do is diagonalize this problem, solve these two equations, find the eigenvalues, and what we will find is that the energy E at the endpoint, there are two values, we call them plus minus, they are given by h bar squared times b1 half, which is the coordinate of the endpoint squared divided by 2m. This is the free electron uh, value plus or minus the magnitude or the modulus of the component, Fourier component V, V1 of the lattice periodic potential. So the stronger the lattice periodic potential is, the stronger will be the splitting of the energy levels at the endpoint. Let us briefly look at the dispersion relation um, that one would calculate taking this splitting into account. This is shown um, in comparison to the previous um, free electron dispersion which we have on the left here on the right. And currently we are dealing with the case where gamma, uh, where we go from gamma to m and we see that in contrast to this case where at the m point we had a degeneracy we've now split the de degeneracy and uh, this splitting is due to this plus minus vb1 term that we've just found. In a very similar way one proceeds for uh, the first, uh, fourth part of the problem um, which deals with the um, splitting near the k-point. Now if we are interested in the k-point we have already seen that the dispersion relation coming from gamma, that coming from this point and that coming from this reciprocal lattice point would be degenerate at k. So we have a threefold degeneracy here. In the same spirit as before we will therefore have a threefold or a three by three Hamilton Hamiltonian matrix, which and th this uh, results in a three by three eigenvalue problem. So, let me write down this uh, three by three matrix. Again, on the diagonal, we have h bar squared k squared over two m, which is the free electron dispersion coming from gamma. We have h bar squared times k minus b1 squared over t 2m, which is the dispersion relation coming from this point into k. And we have as the third diagonal component h bar squared times k plus b2 squared over 2m and we see the plus b2 means that we have inserted the reciprocal lattice vector minus b2 because this point has the coordinate minus b2. Now what are the off-diagonal elements? Again, we have to look for the differences uh, in the reciprocal lattice vectors. So the difference between B1 and gamma is again V B1. The V minus B1 would appear here. And of course, again, this relation holds. Um, then we have the difference between the gamma point and the minus b2 point. So we have v of minus b2. And last but not least, we have the difference between
between b1 and minus b2, which is v minus b1 minus b2. Now the uh, missing elements on the other side are just the conjugate complex uh, numbers or those that um, we get from by inverting the sign of the reciprocal lattice vector. So here we have v b2 and v of b1 plus b2. Now of course we also have three components of the coefficients ck. We have ck minus b1 and we have ck plus b2 and this whole expression is equal to e of k times the same coefficient vector ck ck minus b1 ck plus b2 and this is our secular equation for the k-point. Now here in this particular case we still have to um, take a closer look at the matrix elements of the lattice periodic potential because graphene is a lattice with a basis. Now in lattices with a basis there's a structure factor which plays an important role and this structure factor for the two atom bases in graphene is given by Sg is two times the cosine of G, the reciprocal lattice vector times D, which is the spacing of the two atoms in the real space lattice divided by 2. Now this um, reciprocal um, lattice vectors, uh, the ones that are Im uh, involved in this problem, are um, plus minus um, b1. So we have s at b1 plus or minus and we have s plus minus b2 that we need for these two guys um, and it turns out that if you plug in the numbers for d and g um, you find a value of 1 here while for the structure factor relating to plus or minus b1 plus minus b2, you find a value of minus 1. This means that there is a, um, a difference in sign, right? You can imagine that since all these um, distances that we have in our contributions in the reciprocal lattice vectors are the same, um, these matrix elements will have the same magnitude. But now the sign of these um, matrix elements will be different. We will have um, a positive sign, for example, for these two and these two matrix elements, while we will have a negative sign for these two matrix elements. So the matrix will have a form that looks like this. I don't write down the diagonal matrix elements anymore, but we could say there is a matrix element here which has a positive sign. There's another one with a positive sign here, but then there is one with a negative sign there. And likewise, we will have a matrix element A here, a matrix element A here, and a matrix element minus A there. So this times the component vector 
is equal to e of k times the component vector is the eigenvalue problem that we have to solve. And now you can see that there is a certain symmetry in this matrix. You see that we can um, exchange the indices uh, 2 and 3 in this matrix. Uh, we can exchange these two elements and exchange these two elements because they will be degenerate at the k point and we still have the same matrix. And this uh, is essentially a um, um, reflecting the fact that there is a symmetry line in k space um, from gamma to k. So if we take a line uh, containing gamma and k, there's a mirror symmetry of these two contributing reciprocal lattice points, and this mirror symmetry gives rise to the symmetry of the matrix. And the mirror symmetry, of course, any symmetry, will tend to conserve degeneracies. So, due to the presence of this mirror symmetry, we will have split these three energy levels into two plus one energy level and not into three separate levels. Two remain degenerate because of the symmetry of this Hamiltonian matrix. Actually, working out um, the dispersion relation, I will put this here, results in the energy Ek, um, which we call given index D, because this is the um, a twofold degenerate one. And D stands for Dirac. This is the Dirac point um, energy eigenvalue. This would be H bar squared k squared, and k is now the vector that points from gamma to k uh, over 2m. Uh, that's the free electron value, plus this matrix element A that we had here. Uh, correspondingly, so this is the two-fold two -fold degenerate one. Correspondingly, we have a singly degenerate eigenvalue Ek, which is given by h bar squared k squared over 2m minus twice the matrix element A. So this one is not degenerate, no degeneracy for this one. So it's the secret of graphene, and this is why graphene is so interesting, that there is the symmetry that protects or keeps this twofold degeneracy of at the k-point. And this degeneracy can be seen in, a, in our uh, dispersion relation that one could calculate. Uh, so here we are now dealing with the stretch from gamma to k. We see how the parabolic dispersion comes up from gamma, as it did in the free electron case. But then here, at the k-point, there is this special behavior that there are still two dispersions, this one and this one, that simply cross at this point. So at k there is a twofold degeneracy that remains, and we call this the Dirac point. And there's a third level that is split off due to the matrix element by 2a um, or 3a from the k point, um, uh, from the Dirac point energy that we have here. You can also see that the matrix element a must be negative to have the degenerate state lower in energy, as it is in real graphene, uh, than the non-degenerate split-off state. So, with this um, um, solution, we have um, solved the whole problem. We've seen uh, significant uh, properties of the band structure of graphene, starting from the construction of the reciprocal lattice, 
and the first prion zone. And then we have looked into the free electron dispersion. We have seen how we construct a free electron dispersion, which is relatively easy to visualize in, uh, for a two-dimensional material. And then we have looked at these special points, these symmetry points, where degeneracies appear in the free electron model. And we've seen how these degeneracies can be lifted uh, completely, as in the case of the M uh, states, the M point. And we've also seen how um, deeper symmetries of the Hamiltonian or the graphene lattice can also lead uh, to maintaining certain degeneracies like the twofold degeneracy at K.